but yeah, my I think my main impression overall is I, I didn't have an idea to latch on to. You know, what was the main idea? I guess if it was someone was like, hey, sing that one back to me, I, I couldn't, you know, I guess. Right. Uh, and it's not that everything has to be a John Williams heroic theme, but um, something that... I mean, that would be okay too, right? That would be okay too, yeah. <laughs> right. Today, I'm joined by Mark Richards of filmmusicnotes.com. We're going to be looking at some of the October 22 composing competition entries that were not finalists and try to give some feedback some advice, so hopefully some helpful tips about, you know, what, what kind of stands out to us that maybe you could work on, some ideas for improvement. Um, I think that's about it. So I put a request on Discord for volunteers for feedback. After about 30 people offered, I shut it down. Uh, so to choose from this, I just chose random numbers from 1 to 30. That's how we ended up with the entries we have today. First one we're going to look at is Arrival at the Town of the Wicked by Yoni Thys. Okay, so Mark, what are your first impressions or thoughts? Um, yeah, okay, so I think it has a strong theme to it. You know, once we get into that main theme, if we say to R14 right here, um, has a lot of forward drive because it's basically structured as this kind of sentence, right? You have this four bar idea, four bar idea, and then it's cut into two bars, two bars, and a little closing idea. It's nice, you know, it's, it's a nice solid kind of structure for these kinds of things. I guess where I would try to improve things um, is in the proportions of some of these things. So say the intro. So a lot of these entries, I would say almost all of them had some kind of intro section before some big melody came in. This one seemed to me like it could have been a little bit shorter to get to that big melody. Mm -hmm. um, and I think maybe part of the, the issue here was that we have four bars and then basically that's repeated here i mean a little bit extended but it was pretty much the same idea twice here and i think if you're going to do that then you should have some kind of bigger build up the second time so it's, it gets more anticipatory so that there's something we expect at the end of it sorry that was a common thing overall is intros that are too long and sometimes it's like do you even do you need an intro or, you know, or what's the purpose of your intro? If it's really just to kind of introduce the feeling, then yeah, like you said, just let's get on with it then. Four bars, six bars. I think that would probably do it. One other small thing is just once the theme actually starts here. So we have a nice preparation on a, a B, um, I mean, it's supposed to be a B major chord there written with some flats, but basically that's a dominant chord of E minor. So I'm kind of expecting to go into E minor and then suddenly it's an A minor. Now I know this is a, a, a weird kind of kooky piece for Halloween and all that, mm -hmm. um, but just tonally speaking, like musically, it sounds strange because if you start this theme in A, that's going to sound like you're still in E, but it's a four chord of E and you're kind of waiting for the tonic and it, it's on the road somewhere. That can be effective too. Um, I just don't feel like that was exploited as a kind of compositional thing. It was maybe just to kind of jump in somewhere unexpected. I think if you're going to jump in somewhere unexpected, it should be like crazier than just like the, the four of, of E, you know, do, do like a chromatic thing, a sharp or a flat. 
kind of relation. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned the the flats, um, and I kind of have an overall note of spelling and just mm -hmm. some kind of things that don't necessarily affect the sound of the music, but do affect the readability and just kind of presentation. If you could go to the top of the first page, uh, like this flute part, E sharp feels like maybe F natural would have been a better choice. Uh, and there's a few of those again in bar seven, maybe D sharp, E, D sharp, that would also be easier to read. And again, it's not that it changes the music, but part of the consideration is that this needs to be given to session players. And so you want this to be readable and user friendly because you're not going to have a lot of time to rehearse. You run it through a few times and you don't want anyone accidentally misreading an E sharp or something like that. There was also, um, if you could look at bar seven in the harp and bar 11, I made notes to look at those. Um, okay, so, so some notation things like this, like the 16th, it would probably be a little cleaner if that was an eighth or a quarter. Uh, on the next page too, there's a bar in the harp uh, there it was just some empty 16th note rests, not doing anything like that. Not the end of the world again, but just this kind of polish, you know, it would be nice to see some care taken through on making sure everything is kind of clean and readable and session ready. Yeah, right. I, I totally agree. I mean, um, I think maybe some of this is like when you're working at a DAW, it doesn't matter what a sharp or a flat is, you're just, it's just that pitch. But when you translate it into notation, of course, you know, we have this kind of diatonic system and you have to choose, right? And if it is basically diatonic music, it should be the right spelling and all of that. I mean, you could even say, maybe we should have a key signature here. And even if it's very chromatic, it can be a signal to the players that, hey, this is a, an E minor piece. Unrelated to this piece, but you reminded me, something I saw a lot in a lot of entries was a change of key signature every four or eight bars. It was just like every time they kind of moved to a new harmony, there was a new key signature. And I think as a player, that would be obnoxious to keep up with and easy to accidentally miss that you're like, oh wait, now the now the Bs are flat. They weren't two bars ago and they won't be in two bars. It was just like a very disorienting, unnecessary thing. So um, I would caution about changing key signature too much. I think, yes, you can have one to establish the main thing. Um, but mm -hmm. the frequent changes, I think, are for, again, for a readability standpoint, right. for something that stood out, I think is kind of tricky. One other thing I'll mention in terms of composition is the ending here. Um, I felt like something else could have been done. It, it felt like it just kind of stopped. Like there was an end to the phrase, yes. And I liked how there was a sort of um, extension of that theme. Like we didn't quite get to the cadence, you know, first time, second time, third time, okay, you know. That's the sort of pattern there. Um, but it needed something, a little effect, something just to say, boom, the end. Um, this just kind of got there, you know? And maybe we could just run through that little bit again. <laughs> It might be as simple as just kind of oomphing up a chord here, you know, just to make it a little more emphatic. And it's a small thing. Maybe it's just a personal taste, but mm -hmm. that's what I felt about that. Yeah, I feel that there's a, a certain evenness across to it instead of a real satisfying, like, wow, we've reached, we've reached the end. In terms of orchestration, I think what I'd like to hear more of is uh, frequently changing textures or more frequently changing textures throughout. So. The strings, for example, play in just about every bar, which, you know, is okay because they can, you know, they never tire or have to breathe or anything. But it's just, um, I felt like there could have been more combinations, um, more color changes in terms of passing around material or little interjections or comments between different instruments, mm -hmm. even if you have the same texture. So, for example, you have the oboe and the texture back when the melody first comes in here. Um, I'll just show you here. This is my edited version. So this wasn't here before. I put in a little horn, some decorations there just to give it some kind of life there, right? In terms of the, the color changes. Um, and let me just let me see if I can do it this way. 
and play what was there before. So I think this is the unedited version. Okay, so what I did here was to add, sorry, over here, uh, was to add some, yeah, some horn color there. And then when the second part, the second phrase of this sentence comes in, um, just to change the color. So I doubled it up in the violin, added a little octave higher thing to make it like a climax at the end. I uh, also did that to the flute, just boosted up there to the higher octave. And then the oboe is still there. It's still basically what you had at the beginning, just a little bit more uh, color changes. So now I'll play that version here. So just things like that, you know? Yeah, there's a lot more shape within the sections because that's something I think sometimes people forget is you have form on the whole minute and a half piece, but every section within also needs some form and shape and crafting like that. So, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I even did some stuff like the, the the middle, like the B section of this felt a little heavy to me in terms of the scoring, like it could lighten up and then you could switch back and forth in a kind of call and response kind of way, because it sounded like you're trying to do that with these uh, kind of heavier chords here. So just to show you what that would sound like. And so on. So it just kind of leaves room for these brass to be a little more special when they come in there as some kind of effect. So that's all, just lightening up some of the scoring, um, giving it a chance to pass back and forth. Um, but as I say, this is very strong material in terms of the thematic writing, you know, it has a good solid structure to it. Um, and even, I like the, the oboe and string, the, the pizzicato at the beginning here, like it's a nice texture, you know, very light and kind of um, that cartoony feel that we talked mm -hmm. about with these, uh, with, with the image. Okay, so the next one I have is A Little Child's Nightmare on a Carriage Ride by Calais. <laughs> I think my first um, main impression is that the title doesn't quite line up. You know, for example, hmm. we have this like E flat major seven chord. It doesn't feel like a nightmare to me. <laughs> it feels maybe a dream, perhaps, but um, a little child's nightmare on a carriage ride. I, I 
if, if that's going to be your title, I, I would want to sell that with some more extreme, frightening things or drama or just you know so that's one thing that stood out is just kind of the, the, you know and throughout i heard just kind of these every so often these kind of major chords and so there was a slightly even though things are not necessarily always tonal there was a certain pleasantness <laughs> in certain places you know that didn't quite match the didn't didn't quite fit for me the on the relevance side but yeah my i think my main impression overall is i, I didn't have an idea to latch on to. You know, we talked about dreamy, and so I was kind of floating through it the whole time without quite um, being able to find my my place necessarily. I don't know if that's the best way to articulate what I mean, but you know, what was the main idea? I guess if it was someone was like, "Hey, sing that one back to me," I, I couldn't. <laughs> you know, I guess. Right. Uh, and it's not that everything has to be a John Williams heroic theme, but. Um, something that I mean that would be okay too. Right? That would be okay too. Yeah, <laughs> right. But something that I could be like, oh yeah, that's the one with whatever. Um, it's not quite clearly defined for me. I think. Yeah, I, I had that too. I mean, um, measure sticks. We can just go to that for a second. Mm -hmm. Where it, I guess the, this melody kind of shows up, and the flute. Yeah, I can play that if you want. Right, so that's an idea that comes back. I mean, it's it's an, a main melodic idea. I, that's the way I interpret it. Um, and you can see in measure, what are we at? Measure seven and eight, it gets crossed underneath the oboe. And I think that's going to bury it and, and just make it really hard to, to hear, especially like the, the flute is going into a weaker register. Um, can I play just those? Playing. So it gets hard to hear where the melody is there. Where is the, the main line? Now it's it's a nice kind of weird uh, kind of sinewy line that uh, does all kinds of appropriately strange things, um, but it, it does get lost. So what I would try to suggest is to to make that melody the highest one um, and and perhaps double it with some violins there, like violin and flute, great combination, right? Just, brings it right out. Um, so I have a little mock-up of that here. Um, so here's my mock-up here. So I put the flute, you can see I kind of got rid of a few extra lines in here just to make sure that that comes out really clearly, doubled it up in the violin here. Um, and then the, the, the oboe line, I tried to, to preserve it here, but you see I kicked up the flute an octave at that point. So it stays above this line here. And again, the same thing in the strings down here. I think that would just help the clarity. And there are these duplets we were talking about. Right? I just sort mm -hmm. of interpreted them that way. So if I play from here where that melody comes in, here's what it sounds like. <laughs> You know, now I feel like I know what that's that tune is, mm -hmm. you know, so when it comes back over near the end here, it that, is a nice line. It does remind me of kind of 1940s film score kind of sound to it. I don't know. Oh, yeah, yeah, it that's does. This. Yeah, that kind of film noir stuff, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah, absolutely. It's a really yeah. nice line. So, yeah, the consistency of ideas exists, but uh, it's being clouded a bit with I don't want to say necessarily complexity, but, but cloud, you know, the ob obscured that, you know, I'm not able to follow certain ideas if I'm not able to clearly hear them. There can be something to each one of these techniques. Like if you want a sort of clouded melody, sometimes that can be effective, but 
we're, you know, we're talking about scoring 90 seconds here where you got to right. make your impact like uh, as soon as you can. Right. That is true. The context is a big part of it. This, this whole feel in the midst of a 15, 20 minute movement feel, might be more appropriate, I guess, you know, that right. we can get lost in the dream a little more. Yeah. yeah. All right. So next we have a wild ride by Steve Winkler. So this one has a lot going for it. Um, there's a lot of orchestral color, um, strong melodic ideas, and you know, kind of spooky, gloomy introduction there. I think really where I would focus the attention on improving this is in the proportions of the sections. So I feel like when the melody comes in, we're already at the 30 second mark or just after that. So for a 90 second piece, we've gone a third of the way through the piece without actually hearing the main idea, right? So again, it's this idea of how long do you make the intro, right? Just long enough to build anticipation and then get going. The proportions is my main thing. There's some really strong uh, ideas and some, some nice energy. And we end up, because of the time limit, having to rush through it. So there's, it's basically like introduction and then A, B, A. Mm -hmm. And that B section is is a real highlight to me. It, it's felt like the tempo slows down, the orchestration is thicker, and the melody is played by many instruments here. It's just, it's huge. It's a huge statement. And I feel like if that's going to be the focal point, then maybe it should be given a more prominent position in the piece. So it's hard to know what to do because... Um, I don't know the intent here. Like if that is a, a true B section, then I would make it less prominent, you know, um, mm. less, less in the way of the, the A themes or beef up the A and make it, make that more important. But this, it sounds like when you slow down, you make it bigger and thicker. It sounds like, Oh no, this is the real thing you should be listening to. Right. But right. then it goes back to the A and then we feel like, okay, so actually it was a B section. So, yeah, if it's if it's going to be a B section, you know, bring it down in in the prominence. If it's going to be the A section, move it to somewhere more prominent. I guess kind of stronger the contrast between your main ideas, the more time you're going to need to to sort them out. Um, I think that was something that really stood out to me from the Kaplan was how the small ternary that B section is almost more of just like an annoying little cousin like yeah yeah we need the b section <laughs> to fill the time but like that's not the hero of the story that's just a thing this is the hero whereas the the sonata form allows you to be like here's this idea here's this other really interesting idea like how do they battle it out but it takes more time the um, uh, something yeah, i right. think that is not necessarily i think is clever but not necessarily obvious is the relation between the A and the B. This dun da dun 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 dun, dun is dun da 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 da, mm. da, which is a beautiful way to come up with a B section. Like I love the parallel. Uh, I don't think again because of the time. I don't know if it's salient. Uh, 
in the amount of time that we've had spending with this basic idea. We've only had a moment with it. So to be varying it, to be stretching it out like that isn't necessarily apparent. Uh, like I said, it's clever, but it's hidden to me. To me, it's a little hidden, I think. It's 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 not necessarily apparent. Um, yeah. My biggest thing I, I would work on is the ending. That it was just like, oh, crap, 90 seconds. The end. <laughs> you know, like it felt... It felt like that that felt to me the most kind of hurried. Um, and so if you have to borrow time, maybe borrow it from the introduction. And and actually, there's something about the the subtitle. The subtitle of this piece is When the Clock Strikes 12. Mm-hmm. And there are actually 12 bell tolls in this. We, they're broken up into six. Mm-hmm. So six at the beginning and then six at the end, and then it comes to an end. So I think maybe that was part of the the intention here is once that, that bell strikes 12 then you know death the end you know right. something like that so um it it's clever i just i think if you're going to do that um you could i think having the actual literal 12 maybe isn't necessary you could just get the idea across with it with fewer mm-hmm. um you know because you don't need the whole shebang like 12 is a lot of tolls right to get through in in 90 seconds i i thought the effect worked really well i liked that clock thing that we got (laughs) you know i I think it worked mentioned yeah Yeah, i got that in my notes too this this horn plus harp these dissonant chords it's it's just a a great way to replicate that bell toll uh yeah overall a strong piece all right so the last one we have is shortcuts always come with a price by darren clark We're talking about proportion in in some of these other pieces and this one um i would say is would be better if there were fewer re- repetitions of some of the material it's not that the material is weak or anything but that uh what you have are a lot of four bar phrases and there are a lot of repetitions of those four bar phrases so everything stated four bars and then repeated so when you start to repeat a section that we've heard as four bars, we sort of expect it to go again, the four bars, right? So if you do that, then I think that becomes a little too predictable. So I would try to omit some of these repetitions or maybe do something different the second time. Um, so like, I like this opening wonky cello, this solo thing. I think it works really well. Um, I think we just hear it too many times in that, opening section even though there's this wind thing happening over top and we we take a good 16 bars to get to the melody here on just a basically a four bar segment that's repeated yeah i want to mention i have the same note i I wrote that it takes about 43 seconds to move past the introduction um so half the piece is an introduction because even though we have these wind parts it, it it feels a bit like a loop with kind of vertical parts stacking up and that kind of being stuck on the the G to D, G to D thing is is 
almost more just tension building in a way that it's just like, okay, something's going to happen, you know, just, just get ready for it. That's why even though the parts are on top, it, it doesn't feel like the main event has, has arrived yet because we're still just kind of like layering and stacking and preparing for something to come. So, yeah. So I cut out the repetitions of these four bar groups here. So it's four on the cello, four with the, the wind line and then into the melody. I'll play that in just a second, but I changed something else which is the harmony. So you mentioned this 1-5, one, 1-5, five, one, five, or G-D, G-D. That kind of harmony can tire out very quickly, right? If you don't start to do something else with it. So I'm suggesting that you could have like a, you know, two bars of one and then a two chord, then a five chord. So it has this kind of sense of progression to it, that you're leading towards the end and then you can start over and go somewhere else if you like. So I changed that and I changed one note of this little cello line to fit that two chord. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to just preserve as much as I can here. But anyway, here's the redone beginning. Yeah, I think it's the the ideas, as you're saying, the four bar idea, although it's still kind of a four bar idea, but when we have this kind of single unit of an idea, um, it's very easy to become predictable. So if you can, you can still use that kind of repeating technique, but if you could stretch your idea out a little bit longer, then you have more time to, you know, we just, we live in it longer, it feels less quite loopy so one other thing i notice is that it stays in g minor pretty much the whole piece so it's good to move around um have some chromaticism some unexpected twists and turns um, i mean you can do that even within the key you know secondary dominance other kind of chromatic closely related chords um you know neapolitans and things like that um or you can just go crazier and jump into some wildly distant key from G, say so you go from G into maybe B flat minor, you know, this kind of thing, like the melody is this. Right. And you could go from there into say, um, you know, so it's, you could go right into that. And that's going into B flat minor, sort of unexpected, a nice chromatic uh, jump there. Just something that throws it off in terms of the the tonic, right? The key. Well, I think that's important in that kind of relevance category as far as the image being well, spooky and mysterious. We can't play it too safe the whole time or we lose any of that sense of mystery or magic that might be hiding in the picture. I thought this, so we were talking about these kind of four bar ideas. So this is a really nice texture. You know, we have these chords in the brass and, you know, the, the harp parts and everything. To me, at some point, it's kind of lacking a surface level idea or something, you know, that, that it's like a nice background part. And then it's like, well, where's, where's the melody on top, perhaps? Like the woodwinds are just not doing anything. There's, there's room for them to be doing something in the foreground, but I'm missing mm -hmm. a foreground element for a while, for what, 12 bars maybe or something, you know, through that, um, that I think would add some more visceral interest on top of a nice texture that's behind it. Now the end, we talked about endings before. I think this one needed something. I just, it just kind of ended on a chord, you know, it was mm -hmm. like punked. Um, I think we could do something else and just give it like a couple of bars to develop before you hit this last chord. So for example, um, I think I, I did this one, um, just did a little quick thing here. Like I tried to use what's there just, um, so we're in G, right? And I sit on the, the D in the bass there is just a dominant build up. use the flourish, but I start soft and then build up to the final chord. So I can just play through that. Yeah, 
you know, something like that. This is just kind of unexpected. Throw off that four bar phrasing a little bit, but use the same material. That's all. Back on the original, I think, I, think, I don't know if I quite got a look, but I think the the brass voicings may have been spread a little thin. You'll get, if these were closer voicings, I think you'd get a nice fuller sound out of it. Um, and use, I would use those trombones too. You get a nice six, you know, you've got six brass instruments. I think you get a nice six note, but closer voice chord and it will have a little more punch uh, and body to it. I think when you're spreading individual players out like this, that one trumpet, you know, every one of them is going to kind of sound, the farther away they are from everyone else, the thinner they're going to sound and more isolated. Um, so yeah. especially for kind of different colors, you know, horns and trumpets, you know, just, I, I would bring them a little tighter together. I think also um, more of a detailed thing in terms of the use of slurs would be, mm. uh, we'll get a better sound here, like down at the cello line. That would be nice if it was slurred, you know, and then this one here, like they're not staccato, right? So I think these guys, especially this would be so you could, you could really imagine that being a nice contrast to all the staccatos here. I also say that the texture when this melody comes in here is a bit busy. Like it was very kind of stripped bare at the beginning, just the, the solo cello and then these wind arpeggios here. And suddenly when you get in here, I'm going to see how many lines here. We have the melody line. We have an actual bass line here. We have the solo cello line. We have solid string chords and then sort of staccato arpeggios here. So it's like five different things. It's not impossible to pull that off, but it, it sounds rather busy considering where we've come here to sort of all of a sudden, boom, we've got five different lines. Um, I would simplify this. You know, make it a little leaner. So in here, I don't know if you can see, just make out the melody there. Um, the cello line I gave to both cello and bass with the bassoon. Um, and then just solid string chords. So basically like three parts of the texture here. And that's kind of what I did. So I can just play from there. Right. That's it's just it's simpler and it continues that bass line from the beginning quite nicely uh, that you had over here. Right. And the strings don't get in the way. I think that's especially true when you're introducing a featured line like that oboe line. If that's like our main melody and we want to hear it, um, but six other things are changing at the same time, we, we lose the, the impact of like, oh, this is something important. Listen to this. Yeah, so just finding a good sense of proportion between the instrumentation here, you know, going from one to basically two parts into three, kind of a nice progression there. Do you have any closing thoughts or maybe things that are kind of a general consideration that maybe you've seen uh, from some of these compared to maybe some of the finalists we listened to? Yeah, so... Proportion is a big one, I think. Getting the proportions right between an introduction, a main theme, a B section, return to a main theme, even a, and a closing idea, right? That how do you end with the last couple of bars or so? So these are all important things. And sometimes you can just get a pair of fresh ears and have a few other people listen to it and see what they think. Um, you know, preferably musicians, but, you know, anybody really who's, you know, keen on listening to this stuff and get their feedback and see um, what they think. Because sometimes just hearing it from first time from somebody who's never heard this before, you might get some idea that, hey, I never thought of that because I was so focused on, you know, the wind writing there or having the brass chords or something like that, right? Um, yeah, so even a non-musician telling you, oh, I really like that thing you did at 30 seconds might be a clue. Maybe I should start there instead of taking 30 seconds to get there or something. So even non-musician feedback can be helpful as long as it's more than just sounds good, you know. <laughs> yeah, so thank you to all the volunteers for submitting. Sorry we couldn't get to everybody, but hopefully th this is useful for anyone watching. Uh, if you didn't catch the live stream, I'll put a link to it and you can check out the actual finalists and the winners of our October competition. I'll see you guys in the next one.